Okay, this is a video of the final exam review, specifically for integrals. <clears throat> Questions one and two, using the general power rule and substitution. So, what we're going to do here, question one, I notice I have an inside function and an outside function here. So typically with u substitution, u is your inside function. Then the derivative du So I notice I have the x cubed dx <coughs> part of du. What I don't have is the 12. So if you recall what we learned in class, you can multiply by 12 in order to get to 12x cubed. But in order to not change the numerical value, we have to also divide by 12 in front of the integral. So the original problem becomes 1 12 times the integral of 12x cubed times 3x to the 4th plus 1 squared dx. Now we can make appropriate substitutions. This becomes u. 12x cubed dx becomes du. So we have 1 12 times the integral of u squared du. Now we just need to find the antiderivative of u squared. That's pretty easy. It's u cubed over 3. We multiply that by 1 12 and we get u cubed over 36. And then making the reverse substitution for u, u is 3x plus or 3x to the fourth plus 1 cubed plus c. And there we go right there. You can be done a similar way, except I'm going to rewrite it initially here. Remember, integration and radicals don't mix well, so I'm going to change it to x squared plus 4 to a power of 1 half. Now again, we have an inside function. That's typically what we're going to allow for u substitution. So u is going to equal x squared plus 4, so then du. 2x dx. I've got the x dx, but I'm missing that 2. So as with the last problem, I'm going to multiply by the 2 and then multiply by 1 half out in front because 1 half times 2 really is just 1. Multiplying an expression by 1 doesn't change its value. So now this becomes 1 half times the integral of u to the one half dx. And this is the power rule, so remember you add one to the exponent. So it's going to be three halves. And then you divide by that exponent, or in this case, since it's a fraction, you can multiply by the reciprocal. So this is going to be 2 over 6. Matter of fact, we can simplify here that 2 and that 2. So we can just say it's divided by 3. And the u substitution, going back to the original expression, x squared plus 4. And then raised to a power of 3 halves. <clears throat> okay, question 3 and 4 from section 5.3. It was a separate section than 5.2 obviously, but it's still uh, U substitution. 
it's not the general power rule anymore. It was either using base E exponential functions or the logarithm rule, which are both instances of U substitution. This rule right here, if you recall, if you can write it as E to the U times DU, then the antiderivative is just E to the U plus C. So that's going to be our goal for question three. If we're going to use that rule, then the exponent of the base, the exponential, becomes u. Derivative is negative 8x cubed. So we've got the negative and the x cubed. But we don't have this 8. There's a 3 where that 8 should be. And that's pretty easy to fix. You can pull the 3 out front and multiply by the 8 and then divide by the 8. So this becomes 3 8. And then we have negative 8x cubed. And then e negative 2x to the fourth dx. This can be u, so we've got e to the u, and this is du, so we've, we've got what we need to rewrite this as 3 eighths times e to the u du. And then according to the exponential rule, um, the antiderivative of e to the u is just e to the u, so we've got e to the u. So this is 3 eighths times e to the negative 2x to the fourth plus c. And a question for the log rule of integration, if you can have your expression substituted as du over u, then the antiderivative of that is the natural log of the absolute value of u. That's going to be our goal here in question four. The denominator then would be our u. So u equals 3 minus x cubed. So then du is negative 3x squared dx. So we've got the x squared dx. It needs to be a negative 3, so we can multiply it by the negative 3 and multiply by negative 1 third in front. So now the 3x squared dx in the numerator can become du, and the 3 minus x cubed in the denominator becomes u. And then the antiderivative of du over u is natural log of u. And then make your substitution back for u. Okay, using fundamental theorem of calculus now, we're going to evaluate a definite integral. The only thing really that's different is we have bounds of integration. So we're going to find the antiderivative, and then using the fundamental theorem of calculus, we'll evaluate that antiderivative at the upper and lower bounds. So we've got individual terms. Um, again, I'm going to rewrite that as x to the 1 half plus x. And we're going to find the antiderivative of that. This is just separate terms, so we're going to uh, integrate and find the antiderivative separately. So x to the 1 half becomes x to the 3 halves multiplied by 2 thirds. And then the antiderivative of x just becomes x squared 
over 2. So that's the antiderivative. Now we use the fundamental, the fundamental theorem of calculus and evaluate at the upper and lower bound. So recall, upper bound always goes first. So 2 thirds times 4 to 3 halves plus 4 squared over 2. So that's the antiderivative of the upper bound of integration. 4. Now we subtract. Same thing using the lower bound. 1. So right here, 4 to the 3 halves. The square root of 4 is 2. 2 cubed is 8. So that's 8. And then 8 times 2 thirds is 16 thirds. And then 4 squared is 16. 16 divided by 2 is 8. But in order to write it as third, well, it's 8. Okay. And then here, 1 to the 3 halves is 1. 1 times 2 thirds is 2 thirds. And then 1 squared divided by 2 is 1 half. This is 16 thirds. 8 is the same as 24 thirds. And then 2 thirds plus 1 half, 2 thirds is the same as 4 6, 1 half is 3 6, so that's 7 over 6, 16 plus 24 is 40, Forty over three minus seven over six. Forty over three is the same as eighty over six. Eighty minus seven is seventy-three. Over six. And as always. There is ample opportunity on this one to have used the calculators. Don't have one right now, so make you do not need to use fractions on this. You can convert it to decimals, do whatever you need to do. Use a calculator for sure, but I, you can see there's a big potential here for arithmetic mistakes. So just make sure you're very careful. Okay, question six is an application of what we just did. It's finding the area bounded by two graphs. Um, just kind of a rough sketch of what we're dealing with here. x squared minus 4x plus 3. It's uh, some kind of parabola. And then 3 plus 4x minus x squared is a parabola that's facing upside down. So we've got a region here. And again, I'm not entirely sure where any of these graphs are, but this is an idea of what's happening. We need to find the area of a bounded region. So we need to know, first of all, where the two graphs intersect. That's going to give us our bounds of integration. So I'm going to start with that. In order to find out where two functions intersect, or the graphs of two functions intersect, you need to set the equations equal to each other. So x squared minus 4x plus 3 equals 3 plus 4x minus x squared. This is a quadratic equation. The way to solve a quadratic equation is to get one side equal to zero. So I'm going to move all of these terms over that side and get it equal to zero. So we're going to have 2x squared minus 8x equals zero. Factor out of 2x. So x equals zero and x equals four. So now we know that our bounds of integration are going to be between 0 and 4. And we learned in class that if you're finding the region bounded by two graphs, um, you need to combine the two functions. So this function and this function combine, meaning uh, subtract one from the other. And the order of the subtraction is important. It needs to be the function we've called the upper function and you need to subtract the function 
that would be the lower function, and that's between the two bounds, 0 to 4. So what we've done in class, and every time I've done an example problem like this, looking at your bounds of integration here, you choose a number that's in between, so in between 0 and 4, something like the number 1. And you plug that number into both functions. Whatever one has the highest value is your upper function. Whichever one has the lowest value is your lower function. So if I plug a number 1 into here, I'm going to get 1 minus 4 plus 3. 1 minus 4 plus 3 is equal to 0. If I plug a 1 into here, I'm going to get 3 plus 4 minus 1. And that's 6. So this one is my upper function between 0 and 4, and this one is my lower function between 0 and 4. So upper minus lower that's going to be negative, if you combine your like terms, negative 2x squared plus 8x. And we just have separate terms. There's no inside or outside function because there's no exponent there. So we don't need to do any use substitution or general power rule. It's just finding the antiderivative of individual terms. So the antiderivative, negative 2x cubed over 3 plus 8x squared over 2, and the 8x squared over 2, <clears throat> that's just 4. So there's the antiderivative. We use the fundamental theorem of calculus now and evaluate that antiderivative at the upper and lower bounds and subtract. So I'm going to do the upper bound first. So it's negative 2 times 4 cubed over 3 plus 4 times 4 squared subtract at the lower bound <clears throat> so this one's just going to be 0 So don't need to worry about that. Over here, on this side, we're going to 4 cubed is 64. 64 times 2 is 128, so negative 128 thirds. And 4 squared is 16. 16 times 4 is 64. We need to add these two together. So again, this could this would be a perfect time for a calculator. Um, your calculator can even turn it back into a fraction for you. So to add these two together, we want to get a common denominator. Sixty-four times three is one hundred ninety-two. Now, adding these together, let's see, real quick sketching this out by hand, we've got to subtract 192 from 128, that's going to be a 4, 64 thirds. Okay, integration by parts. A little more involved than some of the others. In integration by parts, remember the rule is if your original integral problem can be substituted using u and dv, 
there's no exponents, there's nothing else there, it's just u and dv, then the formula is u times v minus the integral of v du. So if you notice, integration works, integration by parts works when you have a product, u multiplied by dv, one of the factors of the product has to be u, the other factor has to be dv. So here we've got a product, x to the fourth times natural log of x, we decide which one's u and which one's dv. And recall the guidelines for u. Um, u needs to be something, in this case I'm going to choose u to be the natural log of x. The guideline for choosing u is when you take the derivative du, that it needs to become more simple, quote unquote. The derivative of natural log, if you remember, is 1 over x. And as far as mathematical difficulty, 1 over x is more simple than the natural log of x. Now, if u is equal to natural log of x, that leaves dv to be x to the fourth. The guideline for dv is that it needs to be something that's easy to integrate. x to the fourth is pretty easy to integrate. All we're doing there is finding the antiderivative using rules of integration, in that case the power rule. So now this can be rewritten. That's going to become u. And x to the fourth dx becomes dv. So we can substitute and write that in the form integral u times dv, which means we can use integration by parts. So this equals u times v minus the integral of v. Now v right here has a coefficient, it's one fifth. I, t I typically like to take those coefficients up front. So there's v times du, and du is one over x. here x to the fifth times 1 over x, that's just x to the fourth. So all i got to do is find the antiderivative there. And the antiderivative of x to the fourth is x to the fifth over 5 plus c. Final answer there. Now it says specifically in number 8 to use integration by parts. If you remember a few minutes ago, I said integration by parts works best when you have a product. Here we've got a quotient. So we need to rearrange a few things. I'm going to take that denominator and move it up to the numerator. So we have a product. We've got one factor there multiplied by another factor there. So one of those factors needs to be u, and the other one needs to be dx. Now, just as a case in point here, remember the guideline for u is that its derivative needs to be more simple. If we tried to make e to the negative x be our u, that would mean du would be negative e to the negative x, and that has not become any more simple as a derivative. So that wouldn't be a very good choice for u. That means u needs to be 2x du is just 2. So we dropped, a, we uh, went from 2x down to 2. That's become more simple. So that's a pretty good choice for u. Now that means dv needs to be e to the negative x. So just doing a little side problem here. In order to get v v is the antiderivative of dv, which is the antiderivative of e to the negative x. Now, the antiderivative of e to the x is just e to the x, but e to the negative x needs a quick little u substitution. So, u equals 
negative x. Here we're using this rule e to the u. We're going to try to use this rule e to the u du. So u is the exponent, negative x, which means du is negative 1 dx. Well, we've got the dx, we just don't have the negative 1. So we need to multiply by negative 1 and then divide by negative 1. 1 divided by negative 1 is just negative 1. And then this whole thing here can just be written now as e to the u. And remember that integral of e to the u is just e to the u. So we have negative 1, or just rather negative e to the negative x. So that's how we found v, negative e to the negative x. So we've got u times dv. So this is an example of integration by parts. So the formula is u times v minus the integral of v. v has a coefficient there, so I tend to like to put those in front, times du. And again, 2, we have a coefficient there, so I'm going to actually write that coefficient in front. We've got negative 2 and we just we just found the antiderivative of, x, of e to the negative x. We did it up here in this problem. So it turned out to be negative e to the negative x. minus here because we've got 2 times that negative, which made it minus. Partial fraction decomposition. So a problem that we did earlier, I think it was question number uh, question number three, we tried to use the integral of du, or we used the integral of du over u, and if you recall that was the natural log of u. The reason that doesn't work here is if we tried to make that u, then du would be 2x minus 2. There's no way we can turn the numerator into that. We can't multiply by variables, we can only multiply by numbers. So that's why we need to use something other than du over u on this one. Partial fraction decomposition. So it's a technique that you learned back in 1050. You're going to factor the denominator. So that factors into x and x minus 2, since there's two factors the denominator there's going to be two partial fractions a over x and a over x minus 2. Now the goal is just to get this equation to not have any rational expressions so we're going to multiply the whole equation by the lowest common denominator. What that results with over here is the denominators cancel you're going to be left with 2. When the multiplies there the x's cancel so a multiplies the x minus 2, and when it multiplies there, the x minus 2's cancel, so b multiplies with the x. Now, if I want to find out what b equals, for example, my goal is going to be to try to cancel a, uh, and if I multiply a by 0, then a would disappear. The only way to make a multiply by 0 is to let x right there equal 2. Because 2 minus 2 is 0. So if I let 
x equal 2 and plug it in for both of those x's. The a part's going to disappear because 2 minus 2 is 0, and 0 times 2 is 0. So the equation becomes 2 equals 2b, so b equals 1. Now if I want to figure out what a equals, I need to cancel b somehow, so now I could let x equal 0. So if I let x equals 0 and plug that in for both x's, I'm going to get the equation 2 equals negative 2a, so a equals negative 1. So the original expression 2 over x squared minus 2x can be separated into partial fractions. Negative 1 over x plus 1 over x minus 2. And then that can be split into two different integration problems. And the derivative, or the derivative, <laughs> the integral of 1 over x is natural log, so that's just negative natural log of x. And same with this one here, that's the natural log of the absolute value of x minus 2. Okay, question number 10, improper integral because we have one of the bounds of integration that's infinite. So what we learn in section 6.4 is to turn this into a limit problem, and then replace that bound that was infinite with that letter A in this case. And then proceed to integrate as normal and use the fundamental theorem of calculus and at the end evaluate the limit. So we need to find the antiderivative of that expression. Now it's written in the form of a fraction or a rational expression, so we could try to make it du over u. So u would be the denominator. du would be 2x dx. We've got the x dx. Just missing a 2. Well, that's not a huge problem. We can multiply by a 2 and then multiply by a one-half. So what we have is one-half. I'm, I'm dropping the limit part of this for just a second. I'll add it back on at the end. One-half. I'm also dropping the bounds of integration just to focus more on the integration itself. This is one-half times the integral of du over u, which is one-half times the natural log of the absolute value of u, which is one half times the natural log of the absolute value of x squared plus one. So there's our antiderivative. Now I'm going to apply the fundamental theorem of calculus. Upper bound goes first, so this is one half times the natural log of 0 plus 1, which is 1. And then the lower bound is 1 half times the natural log of a squared plus 1. Now, natural log of 1 right here is just 0. And 0 times 1 half is 0. So it's 1 half natural log of a squared plus 1. So now we do the limit as a approaches negative infinity of negative 1 half times the natural log of absolute value of a squared plus 1. Now we've got to consider what happens when we plug in numbers that are getting more and more and more negative. Uh, when you square that, it becomes more and more positive, so it's an increasingly larger number that keeps growing without bound. And then if you take the natural log of an increasingly larger number, that, that also becomes increasingly larger. 
Um, so this type of behavior where it just keeps growing and growing and growing with no bound is divergent. So we would say in this case that it diverges.